from the point of inception to the point of completion. Nehemiah, you recall, is the man who stands before us in Scripture as the one who began, continued, and ended. We saw him yesterday laying foundations. He called to the people in chapter 2, verse 17, Come, let us build. And so the work was begun. And we are pursuing our narrative today to chapter 6, verse 15, So the wall was finished. And we will seek to learn from this portion of the Word of God, Nehemiah 4, 5, and 6, principles of perseverance to the end. At what characteristic points the work of God comes under assault and how that assault is to be met in what ways the enemy would seek to bring the work of God to a halt and how the enemy is to be frustrated. The three chapters match three distinct aspects of this problem. In chapter 4, the subject is the general ceaseless pressure to give up general ceaseless pressure to give up. As we work our way, very briefly I'm afraid, through this chapter, we will see that it was a pressure upon every member of the team. Each felt it. It was a general unremitting assault upon the spirits of all alike we learn the lesson that as soon as a person becomes involved in consecration, commitment to the work of God in any way, as soon as a person becomes involved in the Lord's work, that person comes under the scrutiny of the Lord's enemies and the attack starts. Conflict is the hallmark of Christian experience. Had Nehemiah remained as the royal cupbearer, he would have known nothing of this conflict. He only entered into the arena of conflict because he entered into the arena of consecration. He only entered into the place of attack because he entered into the place of service. Let him remain in Shushan the palace and he will know nothing of Sanballat and Tobiah and Jeshem. It is when the arena of service is entered that the time of conflict and opposition starts. It is native to the people of God. Now we'll review the lines of attack as the enemy began to put this ceaseless general pressure upon the people of God involved in his work. The first line of attack was scorn in verses 1 to 6 of chapter 4. It came to pass when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and he mocked the Judites. He mocked them. That's the first thing. Scorn. It was scorn directed against the people themselves. Verse 2. What do these feeble Judahites directed against them what do they think they can do scorn of the people themselves it was scorn of their hopes will they restore they had set their hands to restoring their hope was mocked will they restore it was scorn directed against their religious confidence Will they sacrifice, said Sanballat to the garrison in Samaria? Will they sacrifice? Are they relying upon their God to see them through? Well, we'll see whether there's any substance in that reliance or not. Mocking their religious trust. Mocking their zeal. Will they make an end in a day? 
They were going to this task absolutely bold-headed, going at it like people demented. And Sanballat mocked their very zeal in the work of God. Do they think that they're going to finish this by nightfall? It mo he mocked their problems. Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish, seeing that they are burnt? Old burnt stonework covered over by rubble. What do they think they can do with that? And Tobiah the Ammonite, Sanballat's sidekick, Tobiah the Ammonite was by him and he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall break down their stone wall. He mocked their accomplishments. There's tremendous subtlety in the word of Tobiah. The fox was characteristic, the characteristic inhabitant of ruins. And so he pointed out the ruined state of the city, the habitation of foxes. He said, there's no need for us to go against that wall. All it will need is one of Jerusalem's own foxes to walk out and that will be the end of the matter. So they were mocked in this wholesale manner. And this attack by scorn was counterattacked by prayer and by work. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. If time permits, I'd like to come back to look further at this prayer of Nehemiah, but I want you to observe First of all, its place in the narrative. And this, of course, is the main truth. They were scorned and they prayed. Hear, O our God. And notice the lovely double basis of the prayer. In verse 4, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. The people of God, in that privileged position of pleading their own necessities before God, for we are despised. And then in verse 5, Cover not their iniquity, let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee. The people of God can plead that immensely stronger ground of God's defense of his own good name, they have provoked thee. So they plead both themselves and their heavenly Father. They reply in prayer, verse 6, and they reply in work. Uh, the Revised Version says, so we built the wall, so does the Revised Standard Version. But the Hebrew simply has the conjunction and. And I think that that's more vivid at this point. How did they reply to scorn? They prayed and they worked. And we built the wall. We went on with it. That's the way to deal with scorn. Just get on with it. And we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto half the height thereof, for the people had a mind to the work. When their consecration was scoffed, they maintained their consecration. The second line of attack, verses 7 to 9, was threats. Threats. There was a junction of opposing forces in verse 7, and the geographers present will note that the enemy was on all sides, Sanballat in Samaria to the north, the Arabians to the south, the Ammonites to the east, east and the Ashdodites to the west. The enemy was on every side, and there was an unholy alliance, so that the people of God were surrounded by an allied foe, a foe that linked hands all the way round the city of God so that wherever they looked they saw enemies and out of that alliance surrounding the city of God there came the threat of immediate and total war verse 8 they conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and this threat was countered by prayer and watchfulness verse 8 we made our prayer unto our God and we set a watch against them. Prayer and watchfulness. The third, fourth and fifth threats 
are mentioned now in sequence without any reference to how they were countered. The third threat, verse 10, was discouragement. The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. These were the people who were really nose to nose with the difficulties of the task. It was all sweet happiness to be a bricklayer because you just sat up there on your scaffolding and somebody else humped the bricks up to you. But it was all pain and drudgery to be a bearer of burdens. You were responsible for clearing away the rubble. You were responsible for unearthing the old, battered, burnt stonework. You were responsible for doing the dirty work. And as they got on with it, they saw the immensity of the task and their spirits began to flag. The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. There is much rubble. We are not able. We are not able. The spirit of discouragement entered in. Verse 11. The undermining of confidence by propaganda. And our adversaries said... The word adversary means our besiegers, our besiegers. And I guess that by this time the Allied forces had moved up pockets of armed men all round the city of God, so that either near or far there was an awareness that there were besiegers. They weren't doing anything, they hadn't taken up arms, but they were there, glowering at Jerusalem. Our adversaries, our besiegers, said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst of them and slay them. There was the triumphalism of the enemy, and this propaganda voice was coming into Jerusalem in a whispering campaign. We learn from verse 12 in a moment that there were people coming to and fro from the countryside into the city, and as they came in, so they were the unwitting agents of enemy propaganda and the whispering campaign went on all the power is on our side all the weakness is on your side we're certain to win we're certain to win you've had it you poor souls so the propaganda drive went on to the undermining of confidence wearing down the consecrated life Verses 12 and 13, defeatism. And it came to pass when the Judites who dwelt by them, that is, those who were in daily contact with the enemy, when the Judites who dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times from all places. I'm reading the Revised Version. They came in and they said over and over again, as we would say. And no matter where they came from, they had the same message. They came and they said to us over and over again from all places, you must return to us. That's the nearest we can get to a peculiarly difficult piece of Hebrew text. In the New English Bible and the Revised Standard Version, verse 12 is a continuation of verse 11. The triumphalism of the enemy. The enemy's professed certainty of, of victory. But the nearest we can get to the Hebrew is this. They came in and they said, you must come back to us. You must come back to us. Defeatism. They were in contact with the enemy. They were nearest the propaganda whispering campaign. And they came into Jerusalem and they were saying to their relatives who were working on the wall, you must get out of this place. You must come back to us. Your only safety is to leave a doomed city. You must come back to us. Maybe they were even fearful for their own safety. They had seen their menfolk come in from Tekoa and other nearby villages and towns to build in Jerusalem. And as the menfolk moved into Jerusalem, they saw the enemy coming in from the other direction. And they said, you must come back to us to be our defense. Never mind this city. What about your home? And so the voice of defeat began to percolate into the city of God to take the people away from their work. Now there are three uh, elements of attack there. Discouragement, the undermining of confidence, and defeatism. 
And Nehemiah now makes his reply to those three. Verse 14. Verse 13. Therefore set I in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall and in the exposed places the people after their families with their swords, their spears and their bows. And I looked and I rose up and I said to the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Sovereign One. You've got to learn how to read even your English Bible, haven't you? Capital L and small o-r-d means the Sovereign One, the Ruler, the Lord. Remember the Lord, the great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. How did Nehemiah counterattack these assaults? One, by concentrated vigilance. Verse 13, I set in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in the exposed places, the people after their families. Concentrated, by which I mean that he went round his perimeter defences and he noted where the weakness was and he set a watch beside the weakness. Concentrated defence at weak points. And then secondly, he recalled the people to their God. He said, remember the Sovereign One. How easily we use the name or the title Lord as a conventional formality and we forget what it means. And they in their day, they referred to God as the Lord. And they were in equal danger of forgetting that the title means exactly what it says. He is Lord. So that when you look at Sanballat, you say, He is Lord. And when you look at your own discouragement, you say, He is Lord. The absolute rule and sovereignty and competence of God over every situation. And therefore, Nehemiah, in order to lift the title Lord out of formalism and meaninglessness, explains it. He is the Great One. There's Sanballat conferring with the garrison in Samaria. He, he, the Lord, he is the Great One. Here on every side we see our enemies round us provoking fear and terror in our midst. He, the Lord, he is the one who is worthy to be feared. Fear him, ye saints, and you will then have nothing else to fear. Perhaps Nehemiah read Psalm 34. We could learn the same lesson by doing the same thing. He recalled the people to God. Thirdly, he revived a sense of individual obligation to the whole. Fight for your brethren, your sons and daughters, your wives and your houses. You belong to a fellowship to which in varying degrees you are committed. There are those who are your brethren in God. There are those who are your dependents and there are those who are your loved ones and there is that which is your heritage, your brethren, your sons and daughters, your wives, your houses. You as an individual have a commitment to the totality. Let me revive, says Nehemiah, your sense of belonging to the unity of the people of God and let me summon you to take your place of responsible membership within that unity and fellowship. So he counters the assaults. May we sum up then and ask what is the principle of perseverance in this chapter? On the one hand, general unremitting attack aimed at the people of God in their work. What is the principle of perseverance? One, to pray. Two, to work. 
free to watch. That's it. To make it a matter of prayer. Because God will look after his own. To make it a matter of work. Because God calls us to obedient service. And the obedient person is absolutely undefeatable. And thirdly, to watch, to keep a constant vigilance for the enemy, to pray, to work, and to watch. Pray as the pressure mounts, ceaseless, costly, watching and working. Just look at verse 15. It came to pass when our enemies had, n- had when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught. The crisis is past. What then? No, de- no declaration of a public holiday amongst the people of God. We returned all of us to the wall. That's the program for the Christian. Prayer and watching and working. You'd almost think, wouldn't you, that Jesus had read the book of Nehemiah in his call to his disciples to watch and pray as the recipe for consistent living and victory over temptation. Now come with me into chapter 5. A new topic is here announced in the way of assault upon the people of God. A specific assault upon unity and fellowship. The whole of chapter 5 is occupied with this. A specific assault upon unity and fellowship. Now reading through from chapter 4. The emphasis in chapter 4 is on the collective strength of the people of God. The collective strength. Nehemiah holds all the people together. Verse 14 of chapter 4. I looked and rose up and I said unto the nobles, the rulers and the rest of the people. He brought them all together in community. He held them all together in the bonds of their religion. Remember the Lord. He cemented them together in the bonds of love. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your houses. Nehemiah set out to create a united community aware of its unity. Having done that, he proceeded to organize collective strength. Chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, The work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. Now there's the danger. While we are separated, we are weak and vulnerable. Consequently, verse 20. In what place soever you hear the sound of the trumpet, gather yourselves thither unto us. While we are together, we are strong. He organized the collective strength of the people of God. Each is safe when all are one. That's the word of Nehemiah. Each is safe when all are one. But let that unity be sundered and all is lost. Now it's as clear as daylight in the vivid situation in which Nehemiah was placed. As long as there is a wholehearted, single-minded unity within those poor Inadequate walls, all is safe. Sanballat, wherever he attacks, will be met by unanimity and he will not get in. But should there be a sundering in that community, 
whereby when the attack comes, there is a section of the people which says, let them get on with it. We don't want anything to do with that lot. The people in Jerusalem 3 will not have anything to do with the people in Jerusalem 4. As soon as there is a sundering in the community, all is lost. And it is not only the section that are defeated on the wall who are defeated, but it is those who sundered the fellowship who are defeated also and who kept back from the fellowship of the battle. They also are now in the power of the enemy. Once the unity is broken, all is lost. Each is safe when all are one, but if fellowship ceases, strength ceases. Now what happened in chapter 5 was this. We gather from the story of Nehemiah that the work on the wall was a voluntary exercise. Consequently, with the whole community being committed to this great voluntary exercise, those who were dependent on day-by-day employment were in a pretty bad state. So, verse 2, There were those who said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Let us get corn that we may eat and live. There were people who were falling below the bread line because, owing to the demands of work upon the wall, their ordinary day wage was not coming in. Coincidentally, there was something of a famine. It may be that agricultural work had been neglected while the people came in to labor upon the wall and that food supplies were running short. Consequently, verse 3, there were some also who said, we are mortgaging our fields and our vineyards and our houses in order to get corn because of the scarcity. People were handing over their property to the finance houses in order to be able to pay the rising price of food in a day of scarcity. And, of course, there was the incessant demand of the inland revenue. Verse 4. There were also those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tribute. So here is an increasing company of people in Jerusalem who are either in poverty or descending into poverty in a spiral so that one thing is aggravating another and not only can they see no way to solve their daily problems but they can see no ultimate way out of it because their resources, their standby is also disappearing. And in this situation there were those who were cashing in on the necessities of others. Verse 1 there arose a great cry of the people and of their wives against their Judahite brethren. Within the gradually rising walls of Jerusalem, there was the incipient tendency to be two communities. A community which was being preyed upon and a community which was preying upon them. What a contrast with chapter 4. You know the old jibe about the sort of person who prays on his knees on Sunday and prays on his neighbors on Monday. And that was what was happening. There were those who were with Nehemiah in the exercise of prayer as against their danger. But as as regards their helpless and needy neighbor, they took the position of those who sought their own welfare and were heedless and regardless of the needs of the other man. In all this, brother was preying upon brother. Verse 7, I consulted with myself and contended with the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, you exact usury 
every one of his brother. There it is. Brotherliness. Family unity within the people of God was being neglected and destroyed. Nehemiah dealt with this verse 7 by exposure. You exact usury every one of his brother, and I held a great assembly against them. He exposed their disobedience to God, for God had forbidden lending money on usury to a brother within the family of God. He exposed their cynical abuse of the fellowship. Verse 8, We, after our ability, have bought back our brethren, the Judahites, who were sold unto the heathen, and would you even sell your brethren in order that they should be sold back to us? How cynical can you get? You see what they were saying. Oh, they said, it's all right. We'll sell you to the heathen. Nehemiah will buy you back. You'll be all right. They're cynical, trading upon true fellowship within the people of God. Nehemiah exposed them. Verse 9, he rebuked them. The thing that you do is not good. Verse 10 he admitted his own fault. I likewise and my brethren and my servants do lend money and corn on usury. How honest and frank this man was. He was willing publicly to recognize his own fault, however minimal, in this thing that was damaging the fellowship. Admission. The second part of, part of verse 10, appeal. I pray you, let us leave off this usury. Verse 11, a positive recommendation. Restore, I pray you. And verse 12, an affirmation before God and man. The second part of verse 12, I called the priests and took a note of them that they should do according to this promise. So Nehemiah dealt with this threat which was sundering the community. Now, what is the principle of perseverance against this threat? Well, it is this. The essential requirement, absolute, vital, cardinal, the essential requirement overriding requirement of preserving unity and fellowship. Now you'll have to pardon me if I'm emphatic about this, but it seems to me something to which we sit all too loose. It seems to me to be a hidden rock as regards the generality of the people of God. It does not worry us when there is disunity within the fellowship. Beloved ones, Nehemiah and his city are not only, are not a bygone situation only, they are a standing illustration of the situation of the people of God. We do not call our enemy Sanballat, we call our enemy Satan. But all round us on every side, north, south, east and west, we are beleaguered and the only way of stability and victory is unity. And if we allow that unity to be sundered, we are all finished. When unity goes, strength goes. This is true for you in your Christian unions. It's true for us in our college. It's true for all of us in our local churches. When unity goes, strength goes. It is of cardinal importance. It is imperative that we take action against disunity. It is imperative that we adopt this 
sixfold procedure of Nehemiah in relation to disunity with grace which God will give us, we must attack and counterattack against anything that sunders the unity of the people of God. It is against safety to allow unity to suffer. It is against brotherly family reality to allow unity to suffer. This was their complaint, verse 1, against their Judahite brethren. Verse 5, our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. They were not saying the poor are as good as each, however true that may be. They were saying we belong to one body. We have one flesh. It is against the family reality of the people of God if we allow unity to be sundered. Thirdly, it belies the fear of God when disunity is allowed in. Verse 9, I said the thing that you do is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God? Now what has the fear of God got to do with disunity amongst men and women? Surely Nehemiah quoted the wrong half of the law. There is a first and great commandment to love the Lord our God with all our hearts. There is also a second commandment to love our neighbour as ourselves. Surely he quoted the wrong commandment. Surely he should have said, the thing that you do is not good. Ought you not to walk in love to your neighbour? Beloved, there is a unity in the, in, in, the, in the law of God, just as there's a unity in the family of God. The law of God is not like a heap of stones that happen to be gathered together. The law of God is like a sheet of glass. If it is broken in one place, it is broken. And God is the father of a family. There is no person that I hate more than the person who hates my children. We cannot live at loggerheads with the people of God and pretend that we are still right with God. So says Nehemiah, what you do is not good. You are not right with God. Fourthly, disunity mars testimony because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies. Verse 9. Disunited, disorganized people and the enemy will come in like a flood. Is that what you want to happen? Oh, I plead with you. If it should be that in your heart at this moment there is an awareness of a division or even the beginning of a division between you and someone else in your fellowship or between two factions in your fellowship, then I plead, plead with those who are leaders of the fellowship, bring this thing to an end for you cannot prosper while you are disunited. You cannot bear a testimony to God who creates a family if it is manifest that you are not a family. It mars testimony. Fifthly, it is life that is far below the highest. At what point was fellowship breached? At the point of self-concern. There are varying classes of poor people mentioned in verses 2 to 4, but no class of poor person was able to exercise any sort of counterclaim against the claim that some people were registering not in words but in deeds, the claim that the self must 
above all things cater for itself. They were cashing in to the difficulties and distresses of their brothers and their sisters. And the principle, unspoken surely, but nevertheless there, the principle was this, I also am having a hard time. I must cater for myself. The self which counts itself as constituting the foremost need. Compare now the example of Nehemiah with which the chapter ends. And it is for this purpose that this example is given here. Verse 14. From the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the twentieth year to the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes the king, twelve years, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. Nehemiah surrendered his rights, his rights. Why? The end of verse 15. Because of the fear of God. Verse 16. Nehemiah surrendered his opportunities. Yea, also I continued in the work of this wall neither bought we any land. As governor, he could have exercised pressure. He could have been in the know when desirable properties were coming on the market. He surrendered the opportunities of self-advancement created by his office. Verses 17 and 18, he surrendered his personal resources Moreover, there were at my table of the Judahites and the rulers a hundred and fifty men, besides those that came unto us from among the heathen round about. And that which was prepared for one day was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowls were prepared for me, and once in ten days an abundance of all sorts of wine Yet for all this I demanded not the bread of the governor. He paid for it out of his own pocket. Why did he do it? Because the bondage was heavy upon this people. There is a man who lives in the light of the total law of God. He puts himself in the lowest place, one, because of the fear of God, the end of verse 15, two, because of the heavy weight of bondage and distress that are upon people at the end of verse 18. He is living in the light of a law which tells him to love God and to love man. And that life is a life which says no to the rights of the self, no to the to the opportunities for self-aggrandizement, no to keeping resources for oneself when either the love of God or the love of man requires that those rights, those opportunities, and those resources should be surrendered. The paramount necessity of the unity of the family of God. Now let us turn finally to chapter 6. Throughout the whole of this chapter 6 you will find constantly the first person pronouns I and me. I and me. It's a chapter exclusively about Nehemiah. The third challenge to perseverance is constituted by the temptations and trials on the individual level. 
not just the general pressures that come on all alike, that was chapter 4, but the particular, the particular pressures that come on each individual because he or she stands in that particular place. Particular pressures. And Nehemiah here testifies that he was subject to particular trials and temptations. And he shares with us what they were and how by grace he was enabled to overcome them and to persevere through to the point where he could say the wall was finished. First of all, he was attacked at the level of consecration, verses 1 to 4. Now it came to pass when it was reported to Sanballat and Tobiah and to Jeshem the Arabian and unto the rest of our enemies that I had built the wall and there was no breach left therein, verse 2, Sanballat and Jeshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I let it drop and come down to you? <laughs> it's a beautifully clear reply, isn't it? Whatever we may say about Nehemiah, he had the gift of clarity of speech. <laughs> he was attacked at the level of consecration. He had given himself to the specific task. It was a treaty between himself and God. It had been hammered out in the secret place of three months of persistent praying so that he was absolutely certain by inward conviction that God had called him to this work and he had said yes. He was absolutely certain by confirmatory signs. For God had moved the heart of the king to help him and had brought him wonderfully to Jerusalem with every necessary permission and every necessary equipment. Furthermore, the people of Jerusalem who hitherto had been willing to overlook the tattered and disreputable state of the city rallied to him as one man so that even perfumers and goldsmiths as we see in that lovely chapter 3 were willing to take up the trowel and get on with the work. How marvellous. It was his personal point of dedication to God. Yes, Lord, I will build this wall. And Sanballat said, no, you won't. Learn, therefore, that consecration is the beginning of your trouble. Do not ever think that by any great commitment to God you will rid yourself of trouble, trial, and temptation. If Nehemiah had said no, he could have lived in peace in Babylon. It was when he said yes to God that his trouble started.